Greetings, class. I'm here to go over the George Fredrickson essay that we read for this week. And um, again, I, I know this is a tough essay. It's very dry. It's not fun to read. But if you really delve into this essay, he has some really fascinating ideas. And this is a very well thought out essay. Um, essentially, what George Fredrickson did is he broke his essay into four groups of, of um, immigrant relations. The first one is ethnic hierarchy. And what ethnic hierarchy means is that you have one group on the top and everybody else is on the bottom. And in order to get to the top, it's very, very challenging, if not impossible. Um, a classic example of that would be the Indian caste system, where you have one group on top and everybody else is below. And in order to get up to that caste, it's almost impossible. You have to be born into it. And I think it's fair to say that the United States is an ethnic hierarchy because, yes, I, I think that minorities have come a long way. They're in position of power in politics and business. Women have come a long way in our country as well. But I, I think at the end of the day, if you look at who's still running this country, it's rich white men who own like 1% of the wealth. So and in order to get into that, that gap, it's very, very challenging. And we talked about that in the American Dream and also education. Um Another thing he brings up in that in that section that I find really interesting is eugenics. And um, eugenics is the idea that um, a certain group of people is um, superior to another group of people based on science. It's actually a lot of the science that Adolf Hitler used to 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 um, create genocide against the, the Jews. He was using trying to use scientific data. And um, it's interesting because um, I, th I think that for the most part, eugenics is not a major idea. If you were in a conversation with somebody on a bus or something and somebody started talking about eugenics and how they're superior race, you would say, time out, this is weird. But I think, in, especially politically today, I, I think eugenics have, has made a major comeback. You have a lot of um, hate crime and things like that in our country, and those might be eugenically driven. From another perspective, um, eugenics is still a major, major part of our culture. Maybe not so much with people, but if you think about it, we're already having designer babies where today you could choose what gender you want your baby to be. You could even choose the eye color that you want your, your baby to have. So I think that's eugenics. And then um, from a different perspective, a lot of our cattle, our cows, um, they're, they're bred for a specific purpose. Dogs are spread, bred for a specific purpose. Corn, um, our crops are bred for a specific purpose. So eugenics is still a major, major part of our culture. And if it's such a big part of our culture on that level, then I think it's something that we need to, to, to think about because it might become mainstream again. And I think it's important to know about that and to think about that. Um, another thing he says that I find really interesting at that at the end of that section, he's he's saying that for a long time, um, there there was no white race in America. People who immigrated here, if they were white, they weren't white. They were Italian. They were Polish. They were Russian. They were German. And so, what happened was after World War II. Um, the United States they went over to Germany and they looked at how Adolf Hitler was treating people. And they started thinking, you know what, um, we're, we're treating people this bad in our own country. And also because you had all of these people fighting together in World War One and World War II, um, they stopped looking at each other based on race and just started saying we're, we are white people. So, so it started to change around that time. But going back to the point I made earlier, um, it was after World War II that Americans came back from Germany and said, you know what, Adolf Hitler did horrible things, but we're doing horrible things to our own people. And it's interesting because after that time, you saw the civil rights movement taking off, Martin Luther King Jr., women started getting rights in this country. And I think um, had we not gone to World War II and seen some of the come face to face with what uh, how other countries were treating people, I think it may have been harder for the civil rights to take root. And I think that's an interesting argument. And if you really look at it from this perspective, um, from my, my understanding, I've always seen war as a horrible thing, hor a bad thing. But in this case, war did something good because it brought about a collective consciousness. But that is ethnic hierarchy. You have one group on top and everybody else is below. Um, the, the next one is very controversial. It's called one-way assimilation. And assimilation means to copy. It means to adapt. It means to evolve. 
And one way is like going down a one-way street where you can just go one way. Um, and what he's saying is that assimilation really goes one way, where the minority must conform to the majority. Minority must conform to the majority. And I think that's questionable. For example, when, when I first moved to California, I got lost. I was driving to the doctors and I had an appointment on Hamishaw. And I was looking for H-A-M-A-C-H-A-W, Hamishaw, but it was J-A-M-A-C-H-A, -A -A, which is Spanish. And you start to think about it, you're like, I think that's two-way assimilation because my majority is now adapting to the minority. Or we go to La, La Jolla, we, we don't go to La Jolla. So that might be an example of two-way assimilation. But if you think about it, um, the Spanish-controlled um, um, the Southwest for a long, long time. So um, I don't, they were still in control. So I don't think that's the best example of one-way assimilation. And um, it's so controversial, but what it means it, is this, that if you come to a country, you almost have to give up your identity. And I know that's a very controversial thing to say, but it's not what I'm saying. It's, it's the co concept that he's saying is that you you do give up your identity, um, and I I think that I think if you work really really hard, I think you can maintain your identity. I think you can maintain your language and your customs and your religion. You can pass it down to your children and their children. That there's groups who are able to do that, like the Amish. Um, some Muslim populations are able to do this, but I also think it's hard. I think it's very hard to to hold on to it. So, for example. Um, my great-grandfather spoke fluent Polish. My, they didn't speak English, my, my great-grandmother either. And how much Polish do I know? I don't know any. And if you think about it from this perspective, if you go back eight generations, um, you have your mother, your father, then you have your grandparents, you have four grandparents, and you have eight great-grandparents, and you have 16 great-great-grandparents. And if you go back um, eight generations, you have over 240 great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandparents. And if you go back 20 generations, you have over a million great-great-great-great-grandparents. And then you start to think, um, what do you remember about those people? Um, it's really hard to pass down our traditions and customs. And I think we do adapt, we do assimilate over time. And... On another level, I think that's very depressing. I, I wish that I, I still knew about my country in Poland. I wish I still knew the language. I, I wish that um, I wish I knew those things, but it's gone. It vanished over time. And I also think um, this comes into our topic of undocumented immigration. Um, some of the rhetoric in the past when Arnold Schwarzenegger was governor of California, I remember he got on TV and he said, um, he said that Latinos need to um, stop watching Latino television and start watching la um, English television so they can learn the language. And people got very upset about that. And um, I think that a lot of Americans, they have this belief that if you come here, you need to learn our language and know our way of life. But I think that's really hard. I think that takes time. And um, it's it's almost impossible if you're old to older, like in your 20s and 30s, to really master a language than if you came here as a child. So I think that on some level we we do lose our identity over time, and um, it's a lot to think about actually. Um, and its next section is called cultural pluralism. So we have ethnic hierarchy. We have um, we have one way assimilation. We also have cultural pluralism. And cultural pluralism works like this. Cultural pluralism is the idea that we're going to celebrate and cherish other people's beliefs and traditions, right? And so the idea is rather than um, castigating people or um, rejecting people based off their background or ethnicity, we include them. We all celebrate their, their background. Um, a classic example, we have a lot of holidays that do this, um, or we have food festivals. So, for example, if you go to an Italian food festival and they find out you're, you're German, they, they don't say, you know what, we don't want Germans to be here. You need to go home. This is an Italian food festival. It's not like that. Cultural pluralism means no matter where you come from, you get to partake in this, this activity. And we have St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day, which is an Irish holiday where we all get together. We have Cinco de Mayo. We have um, we have so many holidays that, that do this. We have African-American History Month. We have Cesar Chavez Day. 
Um, and I think those are examples of cultural pluralism. And I, I honestly think cultural pluralism is a great thing. We should be moving more towards this, especially because we're a country that has so many different people from so many backgrounds. Um, I have talked to students and they say that cultural pluralism is a great idea. However, um, it's a bit superficial and it's a bit um, commercial. And I think it's great that we have these holidays to celebrate these, everybody. Um, I wish we had more holidays to celebrate people. But um, it seems like in America, we just use these holidays to get drunk. <laughs> a Cinco de Mayo, a lot of Americans don't even know what that day is. We, we just use it as an excuse to get drunk. Um, if you really want to celebrate St. Patrick's Day, you would go to church and you would pray every day, all day. That's what you'd do to honor the, the, the patron saint of Ireland. <laughs> But instead of doing that, we just go to the bar and get drunk. So, um, or you go to Albertsons, a grocery store, and after Easter, they're going to be getting ready for Fourth of July. After the, so it just seems like um, there's so much emphasis on money <laughs> that we really don't focus on the culture and respecting the culture. And I think that has its place too. And I also find it interesting that the United States is the only American country that doesn't really celebrate Native Americans. We don't really have a holiday for them. You can't say Columbus Day. That's not fair. But in Central America, South America, Canada, they have a, they have a day to really honor Native Americans, but the United States doesn't have that. So again, I think it's, I like cultural pluralism. I, I, I wish it would go deeper than what it does. And I wish it was more inclusive. Um, and then the last section, so we have ethnic hierarchy, we have one-way assimilation, we have cultural pluralism. The last one is group separatism. And group separatism is where a group says, you know what, enough is enough, we're tired of the oppression, we're tired of the way you're treating us, we're gonna move. We're, we're gonna move off into the desert. Um, we're gonna go establish our own country. We're, we're just out of here. We don't like the way we're being treated. Classic example would be Israel, the nation of Israel. Um, after World War II, it's a very controversial history, and I'm breathing over it. <laughs> um, but after World War II, the Jews were very upset with how Europe treated them. And so they didn't want to go back to Europe. They wanted to establish their own country, the nation of Israel. And that's, I, I'm saying a lot right now. And I know there's so much history there, but I'm bringing that up because that would be group separatism. We're tired of how this country, this, these countries are treating us, so we're going to go establish our own country. Or um, let's see, the Amish in Pennsylvania, um, they're farmers. Um, and they don't, they ride horses. Um, they don't have cars and things like that. They're not for technology. That would be group separatism. Um, actually, I, sh I shared a movie called The Mormons in Mexico. And that's a great example of group separatism where um, the Mormons, they, they, they didn't like um, how they weren't allowed to practice their, their religion in America. So they moved to Mexico to practice a religion and that would be group separatism. That's a great example of that. So, um, that's group separatism. And some people say that um, group separatism is a bad idea because if you separate yourself from a country or a culture, then you're not able to take part of the politics. You're not able to gain power or it can also bring more prejudice or misunderstanding toward that culture. And um, I think that's fair. Um, I think from a different perspective though, um, I think that if a group says enough is enough, then they have every right to separate from, from people. And um, as long as they're not hurting anybody and they want to go do their thing, then I, I don't see that as a big deal. And if you think about it, the United States started on group separatism. We are mad at the English and we want to establish our own country. So, so the United States is based off group separatism. And these are key points from us because we're going to be talking a lot about immigration. This is how immigration set has settled in the United States. And I think the two key points for us would be... Um, uh, you, you'll see a lot of um, one-way assimilation in our topic and of immigration, and you'll also see cultural pluralism. I think those are two big ones. And I also provided a movie, um, a Vice News film, um, Mormons in Mexico, and you'll see um, um, extreme group separatism. You'll see ethnic hierarchy. You'll see um, you'll see cultural pluralism as well. So, if you have any questions on that film or that essay, um, you can contact me. Um, good luck. Thanks.